Don't lean to the left. Don't lean to the right. Don't touch anybody. <laughs> Say it again. You are not the boss. See, there is confusion. First Lady, as First Lady and I continue in the Rules of Relationship series, there is confusion in marriage today. We learned last week that some wives think it is their jobs to manage, or shall I say, handle their husbands. But I want to tell you, husbands are equally as confused. There are some brothers who believe that it's their job or their mandate to control or should I say, dominate their wives. Repeat after me. Neither one of y'all is what? Is the boss. boss. Listen to me carefully. God has ordained spiritual equality in marriage. That means that nobody is better than anybody else. However, He's also ordained physical differences and positional differences and functional differences in the, in the relationship between the husband and wives so that the marriage could work in the way that he designed it to. And these roles and responsibilities ought not be tampered with. I want to show you from the word of God. Please stand in honor of God's word this morning. We're going to take a look at your worship map. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. The word of God says, wives, watch out, submit to your husband. As is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. What he's saying here, my sisters, is that you are to enlist to willingly put yourself under the authority of someone. Some of, we have many military personnel, we have many military families in our midst, and nobody's made you, I guess, go to the recruiting station. And you went in that station and you signed on a dotted line and you lost rights and come on somebody, wrote responsibilities, and you told somebody else to tell you when to get up, when to sit down, come on, even when to pee. Can I say that in church? But you signed up for that. And so with that same spirit, the word of God says, wives, you are to submit to your husbands as is fitting to those who belong to the Lord. He says, my sister, you signed up for this. Mm. Not to be outdone, the Lord says to husbands, so they wouldn't get it confused either. Husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Amen. Mm. Love here is not Barry Manilow or Marvin Gaye or Barry White. Come on, somebody. The love that he's talking about in this particular text is a strong affection, First Lady. It's a high regard. It's a love that doesn't come with conditions. We want to speak to you from the subject today. You ain't my daddy. Repeat after me. Look straight ahead. <laughs> you ain't my daddy. I know all the English teachers said, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. You may be seated in the presence of God's word. Listen to me carefully. The apostle Paul puts both camps on notice. He puts the husbands on notice. He puts the wives on notice. What does he put them on notice? That everybody's got work to put in. Everybody in marriage has got something to do. So while it's certainly true that your husband is not your daddy, he has been, watch this, entrusted with several God-given responsibilities designed to help him, watch this, to love you and to care for you, my sister. Amen. God gave him a role to play that when he follows his role, it'll be it'll enable him to love you without conditions and to care for you without conditions. As we get started, a word of caution. Anytime y'all decide to circumvent God's design and order for marriage, you are willingly inviting frustration and emptiness into your house. Amen. Some of us wonder why we're going through so much all the time. I want to suggest to you is because you've decided what the order should be and you're not walking in God's ordained order. And anytime you're walking outside of God's ordained order, you invite frustration and you invite emptiness 
to sit down on your living room and make yourself at home. Amen. So let's take a look. While it's certainly true that your husband ain't your daddy, he has been called by God to do life with you as your soulmate. He has a God-given responsibility to do life with you as your soulmate. Let's take a look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. The writer says, enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol or in the grave where you are going. The writer here is encouraging us to enjoy life, enjoy our married life, because we don't have forever. We don't have all day because life is brief. Life here on earth is brief, is momentary, is fleeting. The truth is, is that life is short. So while we're here and while we're married, we need to drink in every single moment that we have with our spices. And trust me, I know, I've been married a l for a little while. I know all of those wonderful moments aren't wonderful. <laughs> there is the bitter and there is the sweet Amen. in marriage. But I believe, I am convinced that both of those occasions strengthen our marriage, mm. especially when we allow those bad times or those tough seasons to bring us closer. So what does it look like? Let's just say, not us, <laughs> But let's just say there's a, your wife likes to watch love stories. Let's just say. And of course, you prefer the movies that things blow up, things are destroyed. Yes, I mean, yes. all the action. But she loves love stories. Mm. So how about, not all the time, but every now and then, when she's watching her love story, and you know, it's to that, you know, that part where she's a little weepy, you show up with a box of tissue and watch... Oh, not too much makeup. You show up with tissue. Not a towel, right? Amen. Not a towel. And watch the movie with her. Let's just say we want to do life together because because time is precious and life is short. But let's say he watches sports all the time, <laughs> all the time. But come on, sisters, come on. Let's say, and you have no idea. I have not been able to find the football on the football field yet. <laughs> I have no idea where it is, who has it, who's throwing it, but that's okay. How about you show up with some popcorn and watch the game with him? It's important, amen. It's important that we do life together because life is truly short. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes says that you ought not <laughs> leave planet Earth without experiencing some kind of happiness because on the other side there is no opportunity for cuddling verse 10 whatever your hand finds to do do it with all your might watch this for when you leave here husbands and wives there is no activity when you leave here husbands and wives there's no planning there's no knowledge there's no wisdom in the grave where you are going he's saying to us married folk you ought to at least enjoy marriage yeah it's tough sometimes but you ought to figure out a way to enjoy marriage, you need to understand something. Contrary to popular belief, marriage isn't punishment, it's a reward. Mm. By reward here, I mean, quote, it's literally like someone that's giving you a, a plot of land or someone has broken off a porch portion of a big amount of money and said this part is yours by bringing you to your spouse and bringing your spouse to you God has broken off a part of good life and said you know what I want you to enjoy this person this is yours understand that work isn't a penalty it, it on the other side he talks about marriage but on the other side he talks about work work isn't a penalty ladies and gentlemen it's a prize listen my brother go to work but enjoy the proceeds of your work to enjoy your wife. Take the, the Working is not the ends to the means. Working is what you do so that you can enjoy your life. Come on, somebody. Say amen. We got it twisted. We think work is the end of work. No, 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 no. I'm a, I will say to you, and I'm going to get in trouble, don't give them 100%. Give 90% so you can have something to take home with you. 
If you're so tired from work every day, my brother, that all you can do is sit down and press remote control, something's got to change because you need to snuggle sometimes. Amen, somebody. I'm going I'm to get around to that part of the message here today, but you need to walk in the house with a little something left. Work is not supposed to be a drain. Work is supposed to be something that you do so you can finance your lifestyle of love with your wife. Amen, somebody. We just recently, we're planning things to get away. And whether, whether y'all do it or not, it's on y'all, but we get away. We use work money. We're like, okay, this ain't going to the bill. This is going to the getaway. Amen, somebody. I didn't get many amens on that. Talk about it. We plan portions of our proceeds of our life to enjoy if all you do is spend all you got on your working and your bills, man, it's hard to enjoy. I'm going to get down here. Wives, while your husband is certainly not your daddy, work with him because God has designed him to be your soulmate to do life together. Number two, the second bit of insight. Certainly, we're going to learn that your husband's not your daddy, right? But I want you to figure out something. God has given him uh, a calling to share affection with you. Forgive me. I chose this word. First lady didn't choose it. As your boy toy. Yes, sir. Amen, somebody. Uh, y'all don't act like y'all know. First Corinthians. <clears throat> Come on. We're going to teach you from the text. The husband. First Corinthians 7, 3. Must fulfill his. I got a duty. Come on, somebody. Amen. The husband must fulfill his duty. To who? Oh, come on, somebody. Do I need to write that down, some of y'all? And likewise, also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, also the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Verse 5, stop depriving each other. Stop. Good God, somebody. Stop. Stop. We in agreement first, lady. Stop. Just stop. stop. <laughs> Quit. Stop. Listen, you may not go as much as you as you as you want to, but you ought to go as much as you need to. Amen, somebody. Keep keep on young young people saying, "What are you talking about?" Keep living, baby. You'll get that later on. Verse five. Stop depriving one another. Here's the exception. Except by agreement for a time. So that you may devote yourselves to prayer and, and come together again so that Satan won't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. He's saying here on a down low, I don't know if I could use that word, there should be some exclusivity in your marriage. Amen. So if you have to wait, uh, Delvin, then you need to wait. Amen. Delvin looked at me, why you call me out, Pastor? <laughs> come on, if you need to wait, my brother, then you need to wait. For a season, for a time. Paul speaks here of the full consummation of the marriage relationship. One of the privileges given to us in marriage is that husbands and wives can engage in physical intimacy without shame, without guilt, and without having to look over uh, their shoulders. See, in, in other forms of sexual relationships outside of marriage, you're constantly looking over your shoulder. You're constantly wrestling with, should I be here? Should I do this? Is this right? But in marriage, you're free to love. Come on, somebody, say free to love. Amen. See, in marriage, you can explore the boundaries of love from a free place. The granting, though, and the withholding of intimacy cannot be at the whim of either one of y'all. Each one of you, why, possesses a legitimate claim to the body of the other as it relates to its rights for enjoyment. Amen. And I love scripture because scripture is very realistic. And Paul does, however, and rightly so, leave room for those times when physical intimacy does not bode well for either partner. Right. In verse five, he says, stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Paul talks about specific times when one's spirit is so burdened that all you can do is pray. Mm. And, there, and there are other times there is illness. If you got small children, sometimes there is exhaustion. <laughs> you just don't have any energy left at the end of the day. So there are times when you, uh, it is okay to step away for a while. But again, it's an agreement. Husband and wife agree on the time and you agree on how much time. Right. That's because... Good. Regardless of how legitimate your excuse is, because Paul says, he says for a time, and our suggestion it is for a little while. And it's agreed upon time because Paul quickly reminds us that there is an enemy 
hmm. to our marriage. There is an enemy to your marriage. That's good. And they will, he will use any opportunity he can to pollute your marriage bed. So agree on that time. Mm -hmm. And then Paul says, and come back together. Because Satan is sitting around waiting to tempt you because of your lack of control. So wives, while your husband is certainly not your daddy, <laughs> please work with him as God has given him the responsibility to be your boy toy. God gave him that responsibility. I was going to say why you're looking at me, but I know why you're looking at me. Amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, we, can we move on? We can we move on? on? All we right, probably, we okay. probably should. We probably should move let's, on. Let's move on. So God has given husbands the responsibility <laughs> to live with you as your soulmate, to share affection with you as your boy toy, and thirdly, to block evil influences as your spiritual this is covering. Good. This is good. To block evil influences as your spiritual covering. We're going to take a look here at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And just to give a little background on the scripture, Paul is actually addressing some questions that have been uh, asked of him. And he writes this letter to the church of Corinth in response to that. Mm. And so one of the great complaints against Christianity at this time was that it was breaking up marriages, that because of the rules and regulations around Christianity was causing marriages to break up. So let's take a look at verse number 12. And Again, a little bit more background. As we get down to verse 12, this whole chapter is talking about marriage. So he's addressing questions about marriage. So Paul has already talked to the widows. He's talked to the Christians. And in this passage, he says, but to the rest, and to the rest, he's talking to mixed marriages here. And a mixed marriage, not talking racially mixed. We're right. talking about unequally yoked. Right, right, right. We're talking about believers that are married to unbelievers. So Paul addresses this. And he says, I say, not of the Lord, and let me stop right here because this is not Paul's opinion. This is just an issue that Jesus did not address when he was here. So Paul says the Holy Spirit and I, because we know all scripture is inspired by God, right? So this is not Paul's opinion. Paul is not writing his opinion because some will say, well, you know what? That was Paul's opinion. No, no, no. The Bible does not contain Paul's opinion. It contains the scripture given to him by the Holy Spirit. Amen. So he says, Paul says that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Drop down to verse 15. Yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Okay, let's unpack this a little bit. The thought in Corinth was that a believing spouse must never live with an unbelieving spouse. So he said, so if you showed up for church Sunday morning and got saved and your spouse is not saved, then you'd be like, marriage over. I'm saved now. You're not deuces. And that's what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. In fact, they said immediately. So Paul had to deal with this problem and he provided some supreme practical wisdom. Now, Stay with us. There was a prevailing thought that Christianity was the cause of breakups in marriage. First lady said this to you um, in that unbelievers and believers were were totally incompatible. And so once that conversion occurred, deuces, somebody's out. So Paul gives us some practical wisdom here in this text as it relates to a covering. He says, if the two of you agree to live together, then all by all means do so. The, the unsaved spouse with the saved spouse. But if they, if the two of you wish to separate because you found that your life in, and, and because of the faith is intolerable and the unbeliever wants to leave, then Paul said, by also means, let him leave. So it's not automatic that because you're married to somebody who's unbeliever, an unbeliever, that you automatically leave. This is an interesting thought. Sometimes we are both unsaved when we're married, and then one of us is converted. Some other times, somebody's pretending to be saved when you married them. Amen, somebody. And you discover later on that they're not what they said they were going, who they said they were. So now Paul says, y'all need to work this thing out by, if, if, if the two of you, if, if first lady is, 
is saved and I'm unsaved and I'm giving her a hard time about the faith and I can't do this no more and I got to go, then she needs to say, she can say to me, all right. But if I say, listen, babe, you, that's your thing. I'm not going to pressure you. I'm not going to be a hindrance to you. Those, so, so you have to have, Paul says, a major dialogue. This is a tough place. Somebody said amen. But, the, but, but, but remember, this was written to the Corinthians church and they were wide open. Somebody say wide open. This was a church that was wide open. Anything goes. And Paul had to be very, very clear that if there is relationship between unbelievers and they're, and they're able to work it out, then if you don't automatically divorce. That's the message. Watch this. But if the unbeliever leaves, they leave something besides their spouse. They leave something incredible behind. They forfeit the blessing of a spiritual covering that was afforded to them by their believing spouse. Unbelievers, male or female, husbands, wives, you are the benefactor of a very incredible spiritual covering that you get by virtue of being next to your saved spouse. Amen, somebody. The fact that you're in the same house with them means you're covered. Amen. The fact that you got a house note with them means that you are covered. The fact that y'all sleep in the same bed, which is a hint if you ain't, that means you're covered. Amen. Verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified. Now, we, we wrestled over this particular passage of Scripture for days. So we've come to the conclusion that sanctification, amongst other things, really means in this context, you are sanctified husband, unbelieving husband, which means you are the benefactor of divine favor. Watch how you get it. You get it, come on somebody, through his wife. And the unbelieving wife is also sanctified, the recipient of divine favor. And she gets that, how does she get it? Through her believing husband for otherwise the children will be unclean but now they are holy this is important sanctification is a spiritual covering that blocks evil influences the evil influences that would otherwise destroy your family i'm gonna get come on stay with me here when one of you is saved in the household there is a covering come on somebody that christ grants your entire house Listen to me carefully. It's not true that nothing will get in. Some stuff's going to get in, but it has to go before him before it can get to you. Amen. When you walk away unbelieving spouse, don't be surprised if things fall apart on you. Because you've walked away from your covering. And so then, if you happen to be both of y'all safe, can I say that y'all got double covering? Come on, somebody. Don't be foolish about what faith brings you. In marriage, you have a covering. If you're not saved and you happen to be in the house with somebody who's saved, you ought to kiss their feet. Come on, somebody. Because it could have been worse for you than it already has been because they, without lifting a finger, have given you access to divine covering. He goes on to say, drop down to verse 16. For how do you know, O wife? He says, now listen, now we're back, we're back to the discussion again. I know y'all saying you should leave each other because you're unequally yoked. But then he says, let me, let me clarify this. How do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Now, this is important. Sanctification is not salvation. Your covering doesn't mean you automatically saved because you live with a believing spouse. That's, right. That's important to know. Your grandmama's faith is not going to, mm, come on, Jason. Your grandmother's faith is not going to carry you. You need to get your own faith. Right. But you have a covering, but that doesn't equate to salvation. A spiritual covering, covering I'm on, and I'm done, First Lady, protects the entire family. And it's a covering that one day could lead somebody else in the house to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. So God basically gives you time to get your act together. Come on, somebody, because you're covered. Amen. Oh, praise does belong there. I don't Amen. know who. Amen. Give the Amen. Lord some praise in his house. Amen. Come on now. Unbeliever, you don't have all day. God's giving you somebody who's giving you a covering so that you can get your act together and come to him. That's what this is about. 
Now, if you're a raggedy Christian, shame on you. But spouse, unbelieving spouse, you can't weigh Christianity by your spouse. You got to weigh it by looking at the Lord himself. Because how you, how, how's one raggedy person going to tell somebody else you're more raggedy than me? Come on, somebody. I better, I better pass that on. Yeah. I'm going to mess around and preach here. We've seen also this morning that, that although your husband is not your daddy, he, he or she can block, well, in this case, we're talking about believing husbands. He blocks, watch this, evil influences because he's your spiritual covering. The, the fourth bit of insight we gained this morning is it's true that your husband's not your daddy, but he's been called by the Lord to support your needs as your sponsor. Oh, man of God. Oh, man of God. If only, some, if only one person, oh, I better get, I better stop. I'm, okay, verse f- 15 of Genesis 2. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it. Now, this I'm going to hold right there. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it. What, what, this, what, this, what cultivation ent- entails is the expenditure of considerable energy, the expenditure of considerable intensity, the, the expenditure of considerable attention to take care of something that God has put in your hands to take care of. Now, the text talks about taking care of land, but I want to expand the thought, if I can here, to say, husbands, you've been given, the Lord gave you your wife, amen, to take, to cultivate her as well. The husband's responsibility then is to provide for his wife's physical needs. And that's pretty much explanatory. Everybody gets that, right? But, but, but he also, my sisters, my brother, you're also supposed to support your wife, not only her physical needs, but also her emotional needs. And if you've been married more than 10 days, you say, my Lord. <laughs> Come on, brother, my God. How do, you going to help me with that, Pastor Cuss? I've been trying to figure that out for 32 years. So we brought in some help. <laughs> yes, All right, we did. so let's take a look. Hey. <laughs> we, so we're we going to take a help. look at that. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take a look at seven basic emotional needs that your wife has. From who? Dr. Oh, Rogers. Dr. Adrian Rogers. One of the most prolific Bible teachers I've Pretty ever awesome listened guy. to. He is ridiculous. Yep. And so we, we pulled great. some insight from somebody older, wiser, and more experienced than us. So every wife needs the assurance. Your wife needs a guarantee. She needs a pledge from you for these seven emotional needs. She needs for you to provide the stability and direction of a spiritual leader. The stability and direction of a spiritual leader. And husbands, please understand, we are not saying that you need to know Genesis to Revelations in order to be the spiritual leader of your household. That's good. However, (laughs) you you can lead your family by maybe initiating prayer. Bring the family together and pray. Pray the Lord's Prayer. It doesn't matter. Start somewhere. But initiate prayer with your family. Initiate prayer at the end of the day with your spouse. Initiate prayer if she's leaving out to go to work, but initiate prayer. And then there's this thing called maybe devotional times. Yes. Going from prayer to devotional times. And it's just whatever God said to you in your quiet time that morning. It's not like you have to dissect the whole book of Colossians. Whatever God said to you in your quiet time that morning, share with your family or share with your wife. Because that lets her know that she has some stability and some some direction from her spiritual leader. So that's the first basic emotional need. Your wife needs assurance that you're going to provide stability and direction as a spiritual leader. Your wife also needs to know, to be assured, gentlemen, that she alone is the only person you look to to meet your needs. Mm. Amen. Emotional needs, physical needs, relational needs. Listen to me. If my back is hurting, I don't have no qualms in saying, listen, girl, can you put it right over here on this left side down at the bottom to the right? That's it. Amen, somebody. I could pay $100 for the massage therapist, but it's just not the same. Hallelujah. <laughs> Some of y'all get that once you try it while it's here. Amen. She needs to know that I'm not going to look to anybody else to make me whole. I'm not going to look to anybody else to make me happy. I'm not going to look to anybody else to make me Healthy, I'm going to look to her. She needs to know that. Amen. Amen. 
She also needs assurance that her husband delights in her, that you appreciate her, that you're satisfied with her. You know, um, husbands, a lot of times, you know, after you've been married for a long time, you know, that I love you just kind of comes out. I love you. Mm -hmm. I love you. Yeah, and love it's you. almost like it's just a word that people say. But what your wife wants to hear is that I still love you. Mm. That I still That's love good. you. After all these years, girl, you are still the girl. Mm. And I still love you. Wow. It just is. She needs that assurance from your husband. Wow. I still love you. That's good stuff first. Yeah. Your wife also needs the assurance number four that her husband enjoys quality time with her in intimate conversation. My God. Pastor, you want me to talk to her now? Come on, That's man. That's right. That's right. <laughs> on an intimate conversation? You know, not, hey, yeah, mm hmm, I'm good. What's for dinner? Where the kids at? That's not intimate conversation. Help him, help him. I'm going to remind you of intimate conversation when you were trying to get next to, I want to get next to. Hey, girl. <laughs> yeah, it's just me. I was just checking on you. Doing all right? Wow, really? Tell me about that. Some of y'all remember that. So you ain't real interested. But come on, Will, you were real interested. He said, What do you wait? Where, where is he? Come on, bro. <laughs> Now she can say to dude, hit me in my head at work. You'd be like, that's fine, baby. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't even, come on, we're not even paying it. <laughs> you know, I got into a tussle with a dude in the elevator. Wow. So what time is dinner ready? <laughs> she misses the intimate conversation with you. Amen. And you have to manufacture moments. Come on, that's good. They're not going to come as automatically as they did that's when right. you were dating because you were in pursuit. Hallelujah. <laughs> Mm. That's right. But now that you've conquered, mm. you're going to have to manufacture moments. How do you do that? How about taking her out to dinner and putting all the phones in her purse? Oh, that's good for me. Some of y'all act like y'all don't know. And then let them ring, let them buzz, let them chirp, let them do whatever. And y'all sit down and let... Somebody said this. You can tell the married folks at the dinner table and you can tell the folks who are dating. Here your married people is. <laughs> and the dude and the girl trying to get with each other, it's like, so, how was work today? <laughs> <laughs> Number five. <laughs> your wife needs an assurance that you as her husband, brother, are going to protect her from her own limitations. Mm -hmm. You're not going to like this, my sisters. Mm. But if there's that girlfriend that every time she calls and your wife hangs up and her whole equilibrium is thrown off, I, you have to say, listen, that person is not good for you, baby. Every time right. she talks to you, you out of sorts. Every time she calls you, she needs some money. And sometimes your wife is too giving, too caring. And sometimes even the limitations of her busyness. Well, first lady will talk to that. But you have to remind your wife that she's not all things to all people every day. Come on, gentlemen, say amen. There's some seasons when she is just so discombobulated and you need to say to her, you're, you're burnt out because of this. I'm not fixing it because my wife hates for me to fix things, but I'm just going to God point it out to her that this is a weak area for you and I want to protect you in that area. And wives, listen, because it's hard for us to hear that. Because we run this and I got this and I'm, I'm superwoman. and I can do all of this. So it's a hard conversation to have. But when your husband sees that, when, you, when he sees that you've hit the wall, even though you don't realize you've hit the wall, please listen. Number six. Yes, ma'am. Um, mm, a wife needs assurance that her husband is aware of her presence even when he's busy. Mm. Mm. <laughs> when your wife walks in the room, when she walks in the house, wherever she enters and you're there, mm. you stop whatever you're doing and acknowledge her presence. Say, hold on just a minute. My wife just walked in. And you go over and greet her and you finish that conversation later. She needs to know that she is the most important person in the room, and I don't care what room it's in. That's good. She is the most important. That's good. When that phone rings and it pops up, my wife, 
<laughs> Unless it's really serious, you might better answer. <laughs> and, and, and partly because I if, he's, if I know he's in a meeting, I'm only going to call if it's important. Now, if he's in counseling, if I call, it's important, and he knows that. And he'll say, just a minute, I need to see what Margie needs. Because I don't call, so be careful when you use that, but That's good. pick up the phone. When I text, guess what? I expect the text back. So wherever you are, oh, <laughs> okay, I was, I, was, I was talking to the husband. <laughs> Brother said, well, <laughs> that, that, that's a door with two hinges on it, swing both ways. <laughs> It does, but okay, we, we acknowledge to, that, Amen, Brother Roger. <laughs> it's like, do you own a phone? How many times have I called you? But it speaks to her that you're important to her when you <laughs> acknowledge her, even if you're busy. And sometimes it's to say, baby, I need five minutes. Right. Or, baby, I need ten minutes. Sometimes they can't just stop the world because you walked in the room. But in five minutes, I need you to stop the world because I walked in. You know, we got this, um, we got this little, we've, it's taken us a while, and it's kind of funny. It may seem disrespectful to you, but we, it's, it's our code. When, when that one of us walks up on the other one, because I, I work at, at, in my office at home, and so I'm down there with one light bulb and a computer, and that's my, I'm, I'm in. And so first lady will come home, and I hear her coming up the steps, and I can hear her walking down the steps, and I'm just, I'm just in the middle of this point. I just got this. Well, I've been resting for 15 minutes, and I finally got this point. And she opens the door and says, hey. And I'm like, give me one minute. <laughs> and that's it. When you see that index finger go up, and then I say, I got a thought. I got to get this thought. And I'll do it, and then she'll wait patiently. Same thing for her. If I walk up the stairs and she's doing something, she'll, she'll do this. She does, hers is a windmill. She goes like this. <laughs> lose my place <laughs> <laughs> and so but she could do like this but you just interrupted me i want you to know that you just interrupted me bam and so I, i'm like oh, okay i got the windmill let me hold up for a second <laughs> but the point is that you don't just ignore you have to figure out a way to acknowledge amen and it's rude to just rush in on somebody you just give them a minute they may be doing something but you do need to acknowledge them number seven <laughs> we spend too much time on these number seven Watch this, gentlemen, the, how do you meet her basic emotional needs? One of these is she needs the assurance that it's your goal to invest in her life and to fulfill her world. Amen. Man. Amen. Dream, how do I do that? Dream with her and encourage her dreams. When the first lady began the Marty's house ministry, it was almost like what our house was almost unplugged like it was when we planted this church. It took a lot of energy and a lot of time and a lot of prayer, and she was in the house, but she, her head was someplace else. But I had to figure out a way, and even to this day, I still have to figure out a way to share her with that ministry and to invest in her life. Now, you, I, I can't tell you all that I do, but I'm not the guy on Saturday who does a lot. But I am her ministry confidant and, and, and concierge. And so she and I talk about things and she runs things by me and I say, change this, change that, fix this, fix that. That's excellent. Don't do anything. Leave that alone. I don't show up on Saturdays or Fridays to pack a bag, but, but I got her in other ways and other ways that you guys don't get. And I support her and I say, get this done. That's beautiful. Keep it up. We're talking about some heavy duty things with her ministry beyond bags of food. He's got plans to, to take over South Fulton County and help, help soup to nuts from, single, uh, from families who are displaced from being homeless to be having a home. Come on, somebody. Say amen. 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 But she cannot do that if her husband is some kind of jealous or upset or too needy. That's true. Yeah. Amen. We're going, we got two very powerful ministries growing up side by side, but we never felt like they were in competition with each other because of number seven. That's right. It's not easy. I don't want to tell no lie, but we not, hadn't been in competition. As a matter of fact, we're partners in crime. It's funny to watch. I remember the story, when we, uh, and I'll go on to First Peter 3, where we were giving our food at one of the um, senior homes, and so we... Um, we rang the doorbell, and you remember the story, and she said, this is Margie's house. And they're like, who? <laughs> and then we said, let's Crossroads Church. Oh, and come on in. So 
<laughs> she was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Crossroads haven't given out one bag, amen. <laughs> but, but we're so attached at the hip with each other, they think Crossroads is Marty's house, and Marty's house is Crossroads. A lot of times, yeah. I don't know what your thing is that your wife is trying to build and do, but you got to come on. Amen. You got to invest in her. Amen. You talk about having her love and respect. Let's go to 1 Peter 3. We spent way too much time on that list. First, if you're still with us, say amen. 1 Peter 3, verse 7, as it relates to sponsoring and needs. Mm. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. As with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. That That's verse, right. man, this is one of the... This, I love it. I hate this I verse. Love Amen. That verse. I love that verse. <laughs> God's not playing about his baby girls. There is no verse that said, wives, live with your husbands. <laughs> nope. in a, it is not. I, we, it ain't in there. Amen. Mm. God loves his baby girls. He does. You husbands, in the same way, Live with your wives in an understanding way. Watch this. We, we, we wrestled with this all week long, but we discovered something. We, we bumped into uh, Ken Nair's book, Discovering the Mind of a Woman. And Ken said that the reason that men don't, can't live with their wives in an understanding way is because we are not free from male prejudices. He says we can't understand our wives because we're overcome by these prejudices that we picked up as men. What were they? Number one, he says, we're, here are the prejudices that some men, I know the brothers in here have transcended. Hallelujah, glory to God. Some men, somebody said, mm, I hope she wasn't sitting next to her husband. <laughs> 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 mm. The first prejudice that men sometimes have is that one, women are difficult to understand. Glory to God. Two, women are the real problem. If we, we wouldn't have no problems in this marriage if it wasn't for her. Mm. Number three, get in where you fit in now, amen. Number three, the third prejudice is that men are supposed to be the boss. And number four, because you're a help meet, that means that you're inferior to me. Oh yeah, they're groaning now, but we can get an amen for 13 minutes now. Mm. Ah. <laughs> All the sisters are like, wow, really? <laughs> Those are real prejudices that will keep you from understanding your wife. If you, let, me, let me sum it up to you. You think you're better than she is. That's right. And if you do, you won't understand her at all. Now, the text goes on to say she is weaker since she's a woman, but he's not talking about weaker intellectually or spiritually or emotionally. He's talking about weaker biologically and physically. We have biological differences. Women have to go through the monthly thing, and it's, it's just an overtaking of their body. They have babies. It overtakes their bodies. Men don't have to do that. Physically, men are generally stronger than women. He's not talking about intellectual or spiritual weaknesses or inferiority. He's talking about physical ones. And he says, show her honor as the fellow heir of grace. What he's saying here, we'll move on, that you need to understand that she has the same spiritual destiny that you have. Amen. And she deserves to be treated with something called honor. Remember, she has the same spiritual destiny that you do. So then, although your husband is not your daddy, he has been called to meet your needs as your sponsor. Amen. So finally today, your husband has a God-given responsibility to keep you safe from all threats as your defender. He mm. has been given a responsibility to keep you safe, wife, from as your defender. Threats. Let's take a look at Genesis. Going to go back to Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it, but not only to expend energy toward cultivating it, but he said, and to keep it. Yeah. And as to keep it, it means that he is the watchman, the guardian, and the protector. Your husband is your watchman. He's your guardian. He's your protector. So he is, let's take a look at the physical protection and see what that looks like. And please understand, as we look at this, we're not talking about him running into a burning building and saving your life or jumping in front of a bullet. That's the kind of movies he watches. That's not what we're talking about. I'll take a bullet for you, baby. I'll take a bullet. What we are talking about, there are other ways. What? I'll take a bullet for you. Oh. 
I pray that I won't have to, but I will Give me if a I have to. Oh. Okay. See what I did there, brothers? Come on, bro. Come on. Better get in. Better get in. He's trying to make up for that list he just yes, went over. That's all prejudices. I know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Not sure it worked, but we're going to move but on. I got to try, though. So what are some examples of how you can protect her uh, physically? Wives need protection from financial insecurity. Man. We need protection for, from financial insecurity. Man. We want to know that we're going to have somewhere to live. We're going to know, we want to know that you're going to take care of the family financially. Mm. Secondly, wives need protection from work environments. Mm. Um, husbands, if your wife is in a toxic environment on her job, you should be the first person to know. You should already know. And if she's overworked, if she's overburdened, you should be the first person to know that. Now, wives, mm. please know this does not mean you can quit tomorrow. Say it again. Amen. That's not what we're saying. That is not how he's going to protect you. <laughs> go. And not allow. He can't let you stay in that environment. He cannot. As a husband, he should not. But that does not mean you get to quit tomorrow. But what it does mean is that you sit down as a couple and you map a strategy. You come up with a strategy as to how you change positions, how you change jobs. But you, first of all, need to know that she's in that position and then figure out how you change that situation. So that's protecting her physically. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about defending her emotionally. Three ways, um, we're almost done. Three ways you defend her uh, or you defend her emotionally. The first way, gentlemen, is to make sure you protect her name. Stand up for her if her family or her friends speak negatively of her. You protect her name. Now, you protect in public and you rebuke if necessary in private. If she a mean rattlesnake and she treating everybody ugly, you got to protect her in public. <laughs> but privacy, say, listen, listen, babe, you're going to have to, you can't talk to people the way you're talking to people. That's right. You put me in a spot where I'm going to have to punch somebody in the nose because of you. <laughs> I really don't want to jump on your daddy, but I will. <laughs> Not my daddy. I take him. You know, I, you know he, I hit him in that left knee. He goes straight down. You, as I've been watching him walk, I know he favored that left knee. You've got to protect her name. But my sister, you got to help him protect your name. Amen. Amen. Don't be out there, you know, don't, don't go out there, you know, be honest when you when you out of pocket. Because husbands have this weird thing. We just go in right in. My wife was always right. And some folks looking like, no, actually, she was the one wrong. And so then he loses disrespect for, you know, so you, I'm going to protect her name, but I need her to walk in a way that I can protect it. Say, say amen. amen. Second way you uh, defend her emotionally is you protect her marriage. How do you do that? You got to set appropriate boundaries against intruders. We were talking about it. We were talking about it. It's uncomfortable to talk about this. We were talking about what happens when you do find yourself attracted to somebody else. Oh, come on, saints of God. Don't act like you're blind. What happens when you do find yourself feeling some kind of way about someone else? You have to set appropriate boundaries. And the moment you recognize that you're feeling some kind of way about somebody is the moment you start making plans to be away from them. Amen. Amen. Come on, husband. You can't just, oh, well, I'm, you know, we just friends. Yeah, that's how it starts. Mm. Protect her name, protect her marriage, and thirdly, you defend her by protecting her heart. Don't do anything that'll break her trust. Amen. I, I got I got something here. When 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 you nail it down, when you narrow it down, and we're gonna be talking about infidelity here in a while, but when you nail it down, the one thing that you have as a husband that nobody else has on planet Earth, uh, that you have your wife's exclusive trust. She, you, she trusts you. Hopefully she trusts you. I, amen. First lady trusts me more than she trusts any other man on the planet. 
She looks at them a little differently. She treats them a different way. I have exclusive rights and privileges to get really close into her, her, her physical, emotional, or spiritual space because she trusts me. And so you can't do anything in marriage to break that trust. So, yes, I don't always, she texts me and I don't always text her right back. But, she, but because she trusts me, she doesn't go to, I wonder what he doing. <laughs> this is the third time. Where, where was he? He was at the job. It only takes 25 minutes to get over here. And then let's say he put some gas in the car. That's at least 10 minutes. He should have been home 15 minutes ago. No, 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 no. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Say amen. Because you don't trust the guy. You've given her a reason not to trust you anymore. Yeah. The third one is. So the third one is he is your spiritual protection. We've talked a lot about spiritual leadership here today. And basically the way he protects you is by leading your family spiritually. So what does that look like? A couple of suggestions. Don't send your family to church. Husbands, bring your family to That's church. Come good. with them. That's good. Secondly, don't let a spirit of, of contention or hate invade your home. First of all, you don't want to bring that in. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you see it, you do all you can to get it out of your house. Your responsibility as a spiritual leader. And finally, you want to cultivate a home of faith, forgiveness, and love. Your family needs to see your faith lived out. And sometimes that means sharing with them some of the difficult things that are going on so they can see you trust God and watch, they will watch oh, your faith grow, good. and then your children's will grow, your wife's will grow. That's real and so good. everybody everybody in the household's faith just grew because you shared something that you may have been struggling for or something that you were trusting God to do. That's real good. And then there is forgiveness. I can always remember, because forgiveness, you not only give it, but you also receive it. Mm -hmm. I can remember pastor having to apologize to the boys <laughs> I whooped the wrong child <laughs> you know what I mean so he had to go to the child and say oops oops you didn't do it, it was the other I one. didn't realize you didn't do it but he had no problem <laughs> he had no problem asking for forgiveness when he was wrong hey, and so man. he would admit to the children or admit to me that you know what I was wrong on this mm. will you forgive me yes that's true and then finally love has to be we sang about it this morning love has to be the staple in your house we told our kids, we may not do everything right, but please know our decisions were, came from a place of love for you. Mm. And your marriage needs that. Your household needs to be based on love. Now, we're going to end with this thought, just so you know. Um, and, and if we haven't said it before, we hadn't said it in a while, don't get it twisted. There is no, there is no semblance of perfection in the household of the Boons, none whatsoever. We just wrestle through things openly as opposed to internalizing them and not dealing with them. That's the difference. Mistakes. And he tells y'all all our business anyway, so you know we're not perfect. You hear about it on Sunday, our imperfections. Well, I don't tell y'all everything. Some stuff y'all ain't got, y'all ain't y'all business, amen. But we try to be real and transparent because because if you see us as perfect, then you'll never figure out how you, you can't get there. So don't get it twisted. We're not perfect. As a matter of fact, husbands, the scripture is filled with, per, with dozens of examples of good husbands and horrible husbands. I love the Bible. It's not like every guy's got it, got it figured out. Some guys are just a hot mess. Man, so although your husband's certainly not your daddy, I want you to remember that he is... Your husband in marriage, which is a title, by the way, that you gave him. That's right. Mm. You stood up there and before God and man. Do you take this fool? <laughs> Come on, somebody, to be your happily. Come on, till death do us part. Even if you act like an idiot, you don't say that part, but that's the part that you put in there. Do you take this man who ain't got a lick of sense? <laughs> and what do you say? I do. <laughs> That's the title you gave him. Amen. Amen. There are two answers when he said, will you marry me? You'd be like, heck no. <laughs> I know you, bro. I ain't trying to marry. Amen. Moving right along. <laughs> But you got to keep in mind because this is your husband, the one who you stood in front of God and man and said, this is my guy. And as God, so keep in mind, God 
who he's the one who ordained the institution of marriage. And it was God who assigned the roles of husbands and wives in marriages. And while your husband then is not your daddy. Oh, yeah. You've got to release him to the Lord. And then you've got to work with God as he works on your husband. Amen. Give the Lord some praise in his house. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Christ, and we thank you so very much for an opportunity to be in the midst of your people with this word. We do recognize as we, as we read the scriptures in all seriousness and we share our life with joy and we laugh and we may even cry this morning inside, we thank you for the wisdom and insight that you're giving us. We know people aren't perfect, and then there are two people in marriage and they're not perfect. But we do thank you, Father, that roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. I ask that you would touch our brother's heart this morning to do something better and stronger and different. Not to be perfect, but to be, to be the husband you called him to be. And then I ask that when he does decide to take a step forward, that his wife allows him to take a step forward. For some, so for some of our wives, we've been so... It, uh, we've had to take care of things so long that we feel a little possessive about these things. And so I just ask that you make the adjustment on the wife's side of the fence and you make the adjustment on the husband's side of the fence because although your husband may not be your daddy, he has been given God ordained responsibilities to help him to figure out how to cherish you, to care for you, and to love you more. It is in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake we say, amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise in his house. I want to, I don't think I did it last time, I'm going to do it this time. Can you, once again, it's not as easy as it looks, can you, can you give the Lord some praise for your first, first lady for, for doing this? It's not easy talking about your family in public all the time and trying to, two people trying to study one scripture and come to a term zone. It's not easy to live with somebody as incredible as myself, but so I praise God for her. I didn't say how, I didn't say incredibly what? I just said incredible. <laughs> yeah, she was one of those, do you take this food? She said, eh. Thank you. Thank you first. Now, I don't want to let the moment go by. If you're here today and you haven't accepted Christ, and you know that you haven't accepted Christ, and I'm not talking about the rules and regulations of religion this morning. I want to just, just for a moment, remind you that what God wants more than anything with you and from you is a relationship. That's it. He's, he's done with the checklist situation because, for, quite frankly, you can't keep all the boxes checked. Can I have an amen? If it's up to you, my brother, to, do, to be right all the time, good, look, good luck with that. So God said, I'll tell you what I really want. What I really, really want is a relationship with you. Because I've done the heavy lifting of box checking. I died on Calvary's cross. I became the sacrificial lamb. I shed my blood on Calvary. I became the one who obeyed God the Father completely. I gave my life. I rose on the third day. And all I want you to do then is to get in on the relationship part of that with me. If you're here this morning and you know you don't have a relationship with him, I want to invite you to stand where you are. Is there one here today? I care less about how many times you've been in this room. We don't care about who your mom is or your dad is or what. Please forgive me. We don't care about the church that wasn't the church that you thought they should have been. That has nothing to do. This is a one-to-one. -one. God wants a relationship with you in spite of all the other hindrances and excuses that the enemy would throw at you. Is there one here today? Come on, stand. I want to pray with you. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a church home, a church covering. And Crossroads would love to be that covering for you today. 
Amen. I know you watch the news and I know you look in the mirror. You know you need some help. Can I have an amen from anybody? <laughs> you know you need a covering. And this isn't the best church on the block. And when you find the best, the best church on the block, don't go to it because you're going to mess it up. Amen, somebody. We recognize that we're people that, who are still a work in progress in this building. Can I have a hearty amen? Amen. And if you are a work in progress, you love the Lord with all you got, you've given your life to Christ, you want a church covering, Crossroads would love to be that covering for you. Is anyone here today? Amen. I didn't do this before, and I'm going to get in trouble here because I'm going to call an audible. But are there any husbands and wives in the room this morning? I want to pray with you. Can you come down? Come on. Any husbands and wives in the room this morning? We just spent two weeks telling y'all neither one of you is the boss. Amen. I feel it's a good time to pray. (laughs) If you're here without your spouse, you want to come on and stand in the gap, do that. I want to also, if you want to pray for a marriage that is not your own, maybe your families and you have somebody in your family, maybe your mom and dad, maybe your coworker and somebody share with you that their marriage is in trouble. You want to stand in the gap for somebody, won't you come? Anybody willing to stand in the gap for somebody else? Won't you come? Amen. Thank you, Miss Kim. Anybody you know some other marriages that are struggling and you just want to stand in the gap for them? You just want to say, Lord, they're not here, but I want to extend a prayer for them. Amen. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. Other marriages, not ne- not necessarily those who are represented here in the room, but other folks' his marriages, and 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 I want you to be able to, you, I want you to be able to see God move, and then you see God move, and you remember. I remember when I stood in the gap for them, and they called me and said things are better, and you don't have to give them yes, they're only better because I prayed for you. Just say praise God, Amen, somebody, and continue to pray for them. Anybody else you want to cover somebody else? I'm not done. Maybe you're single, and maybe you're single again. And maybe you still have a desire for a mate. Maybe you do. Maybe God has settled you, and you're okay. But if you're wanting to stand in the gap for your future relationships, your current relationships, won't you come today? Anyone? I invite you. Amen. Thank you, my sisters. Because you don't want to just have a counterfeit in your life. Can somebody say amen? amen? You don't want counterfeits. Amen. Because sooner or later, somebody's going to recognize it's a phony bill. So you want to be in a position where there are people in your life who are real. So we're going to cover the relationship spectrum here. We began with the husbands and wives and those who are covering the husbands and wives. And then we begin with, we, we continue with those who just want to be prayerful about relationships. I want you to do something before we even have a word of prayer. God's already done something. The fact that you walked up here, God's already moving. Give the Lord some praise. Come on, somebody. Amen. Don't get it twisted. There aren't, there aren't any magic, hocus pocus words. You know what God wants more than anything else so he can bless you? It's just your willingness to be blessed. You know what he wants more than anything else for you to be whole? Is that your willingness to be whole? I don't want to I don't want to fuss at you, but sometimes we get to the place where we think unhappiness is how we're supposed to be. I deserve brokenness. I deserve unhappiness. Or here's my favorite, my life will never be one filled with joy. That's not what the enemy that God said, I come that you might have life. Come on, somebody, and have it abundantly. And that may be with somebody, and that may be without somebody. Somebody ought to say it, amen. Quit it. Stop believing that brokenness is normal. You are a child of the king. You serve the most high God. Not one of the highest God. You serve the most high God. And if nobody else got you, he's got you. So don't walk out of here today thinking, well, I'm not, I'm not the perfect husband. And I'm, I'm, I got the mama spirit from last week. Amen. My life is over. How about saying, I'm looking up because I'm lifted up? Oh, that's good. I'm looking up because I'm lifted up. Father God, we come before you in the precious name of Christ, and we say thank you. Because although earthly relationships are extremely important, you're the only relationship that really matters in the end. We 
pray that you would cover these husbands and wives who came forward first. They understand the difficulties of being married. After the honeymoon, the rest of the life kicks in. And some of them fought during the honeymoon, Lord Jesus. But we stand in agreement that you brought them together. And because you brought them together, you can grow them together. You can strengthen them together. You can instruct them together. You could even spank them with the same belt if they need a whooping. But more than anything else, you're going to keep them together. Sustain, Father, by your grace, by your mercy, by your love. The Bible says a two threefold cord is not easily broken. When the husband and the wife are intertwined with Jesus, it's hard to break that up. We might mess it up, but you won't let us break it up. Strengthen the marriages. We pray for those who step forward to stand in the gap for somebody else's marriage. What an incredible gift you are to have the presence of mind to stand up on behalf of somebody else. The Bible says, the Lord said, I looked around to find a man who was standing in the gap and I couldn't find anybody. Not today, you stood up and he found somebody. And I thank you. Now, Father, I, we pray that the, the, relation, the, the husband and wife, the marriage that they came up for uh, to represent is blessed. But I also ask that you reverse that blessing back on the one who's standing in the gap. Right now, Lord, you know what they stand in need of. Reverse the blessing they came to give and give it back to them. And I pray for my brothers and sisters who are in relationship or want to be in relationship or trying to get out of relationship. They need your comfort, Lord. We want you to expose the counterfeit right away. We don't have time. We don't have energy. We don't have patience. Expose the counterfeit right away. Make it so plain that the counterfeit look like Monopoly money. And if they can't see it, send somebody in their life who can show it to them. Oh, we thank you. Oh, we magnify you. Oh, we exalt you. Oh, we worship you. Oh, we need you. Oh, we love you. You are, are, the, you are the God of relationship. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the love that's required of us. And we can only love as we love you. And lastly, Father, I pray that while we're trying to love other people, won't you help us to first love ourselves? It's in Jesus' name we pray. And for his sake we say, amen. Come on, give the Lord some praise in his house.